screen. That looks stupid. Okay, I won't do that then. If you're on YouTube, you gotta watch it the same now. There it goes. Okay, ready for you. I don't think stupid is profanity. Curtain. It's mean, but it's not profanity. Glory to the holy consubstantial life, creating an undivided trinity always, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. kingdom come, be done, as it is in heaven. This day our daily bread, trespasses, as we those who trespass against us, not into temptation, but us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. And let us worship God our King. Come, let us worship and fall down before Christ, our King and our God. Come, let us worship and fall down before Christ Himself, our King and our God. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say His steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say His steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say His steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called to the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. With the Lord on my side, I do not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side to help me. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They blazed like a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. 
I was poor shards so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Hard, glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord was bad in me. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has chased me sorely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give them to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed be he who enters in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Find the festal procession with the branches up the thorns of the, the to the thorns of the to the thorns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will enjoy you. I will give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Now and ever and to ages of ages. Amen. Alleluia. 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 Glory to you, O God. Alleluia, 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 glory to you, O God. Alleluia, 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 glory to you, O God. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, the welfare of the Holy Church, of God in the union of all that is pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, those who enter with faith, reverence, and fear of God, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For our Metropolitan Teak and the honorable priest of the Diaconate in Christ, all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For the President of our country, all civil authorities, and our brothers and sisters in the armed forces, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this city, every city and country, and the faithful dwelling in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather, for abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. For travelers by land, by sea, and by air, for the sick and the suffering, captives and their salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. That he will graciously accept in his heavenly altar this present prayer of thanksgiving from us, and in his compassion have mercy on us, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. That he will not despise the thanksgiving of us, his unprofitable servants, which we offer with humble hearts for the blessings we receive from him, but rather accept it as sweet smelling incense. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord. that he will listen to the prayers of us unworthy servants and regard the good intentions and desires of his faithful, and in his bounty always bless his church, speedily answering the prayers of his people. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. That he will deliver his holy church and every one of us from all affliction, wrath, danger, and necessity, and from all enemies visible and invisible, Blessing his people with health, long life, and peace. Surrounding us with his heavenly host, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help us, save us, have mercy on us, and keep us, O God, by your grace. Lord, have mercy. Commemorating our most holy, most pure, most blessed, and glorious Lady Theotokos, and ever Virgin Mary with all the saints, let us commend ourselves and each other and all our life to Christ our God. For to you are to all glory, honor, and worship, to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, 
now and ever and unto ages of ages. God is the Lord and has revealed himself to us. It is he that comes in the name of the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. God is the Lord and has revealed himself to us. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord I destroyed them. God is the Lord and has revealed himself to us. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. I shall not die, but live and recount the works of the Lord. God is the Lord, and has revealed himself to us. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful in our eyes. God is the Lord, and has revealed himself to us. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Of the Lord. We thine unworthy servants, O Lord, grateful for thy great benefits which thou hast shown to us. Glorify be to praise, bless thee, thanks be to magnify thy loving kindness, and with love to cry aloud unto thee, our humble submissiveness. O Lord, bring us back to your Savior, Attend. Peace be to all. And to your spirit. Wisdom. The and I in the fourth floor. I will sing to the Lord, for he has dealt lovingly with me. I will sing to the Lord, for he has dealt lovingly with me.
Wisdom. The reading is from the Epistle of the Holy Apostle Paul to the Ephesians. Let us attend. Brethren, walk as children of light, for the truth, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is a shame even to speak of things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it is said, Awake, go sleep and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise making most of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand that the will of the Lord is what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, always, and for everything give thanks to in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God the Father. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Peace be to you, reader. And to your spirit, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Wisdom, let us attend, let us listen to the Holy Gospel. Peace be to all. And to your spirit. The reading is from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time, as Jesus entered a certain village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And they went, and they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then said Jesus, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Have mercy in us, O God, according to your great goodness, we pray you. Hear and have mercy. We, your unprofitable servants, give thanks to you with fear and trembling, Lord our Savior, for you have poured your blessing upon us abundantly. We fall down in worship before your loving mercy and praise you as our God fervently crying to you. Deliver your servants from all calamity, and in your mercy grant our requests, which are for salvation. We beg you, Lord, hear and have mercy. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. You have mercifully listened to the prayers of your servants, Lord. You have shown us your tender compassion and love for man. Forsake us not in days to come, but fulfill all the good desires of your faithful people. <coughs> Reveal your rich mercy to us, disregard our sins, and attain glory for your name. We beg you, Lord, hear and have mercy. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. May our thanksgiving be a sweet-smelling incense before your majesty, merciful Master. In your love for mankind, always send down your rich blessings upon your servants. Deliver us from the assaults of our visible and invisible enemies. Preserve your holy church, and grant all your people health, virtue, and length of days. We beg you, most bountiful King, incline your ear to our prayer, and speedily show mercy. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord. Hear us, God, our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of those far off upon the sea. 
And show mercy, show mercy, Master, upon us sinners. For you are a merciful God and love mankind. And to you we send up glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. <coughs> now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, God of all mercies and bounties whose mercy cannot be measured and whose love for man is unfathomable. With fear and trembling we fall down in adoration before your majesty, unprofitable servants that we are. We humbly thank you for the blessing you have given your servants of, of this nation. We glorify you, we praise you, we sing to you, Lord and Master and Defender. We fall down before you and beg your boundless, your boundless mercy. As you have graciously received your servants' prayers and granted them, so also deliver your church and preserve this nation from every hostile assault. Grant us peace and tranquility that your faithful people may grow in virtue and love for you, may partake of all your benefits. So we will always offer thanksgiving to you together with your Father and your most holy and good and life-creating Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. saint today. Today is Paul the Confessor of Constantinople. Theotokos, save us. Lord, honor all that the cherubim and the glories, the uncommanded, the seraphim, with 
Glory to you, Christ our God, our sure hope. Glory to you. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Master, Christ us. our true God, the praises most pure Mother, Lady Theotokos, and of a Virgin Mary, by the power of the precious and life creating cross. By the intercession of the holy and bodiless powers of heaven, of the holy glorious prophet, forerunner, and baptist John, of the holy glorious and laudable apostles, of the holy glorious and right victorious martyrs of our venerable and God bearing fathers, of the holy glorious myrrh bearing equal to the apostles, Mary Magdalene, the patron of this temple. Of our Father and the Saints, Paul, the Confessor of Constantinople, whom we commemorate today. Of the holy and righteous ancestors of God, Joachim, and Anna, and of all the saints. Have mercy upon us and save us, for he is good and loves mankind. Amen. A prosperous and peaceful life and furtherance in every good and godly thing grant, O Lord, to the reverend clergy here assembled in the faithful, and preserve them for many years. Offering my last words? No, nope. the last <laughs> words from the lecture. The, the last I words. really wonder about you, Father Gabriel. <laughs> Forgive me. No, I'm just going to be careful around you. That's all. Yes. Christ is among us. Christ is among us. He is and shall be. Christ is among us. He is shall be. The blessing of the Lord and his mercy be upon you. The blessing of the Lord and his mercy be upon you. The blessing of the Lord and his mercy be upon you. The blessing of the Lord and his mercy be upon you. The blessing
general. This is the time to, uh, this is the time to ask them. And for those of you who can hear me online, uh, if you type your questions, we do have a moderator that's going to be able to uh, relay them to his eminence uh, to get them answered. So without further introduction, his eminence, Dr. Chibata. This is kind of dinky. I can get you a stronger one. Couldn't you get a bigger one? More space? Not bigger, it'd be stronger, more, more sturdy. I don't need sturdy, I just need space. Oh, sorry. Mm. We're limited. Yes. Well, good evening. Father uh, Gabriel asked me to speak on the last things. In one sense, of course, this isn't an entirely welcome subject. Given our contemporaries, some of them anyway, excitement with obscure passages in the book of Revelation, and especially the book of Daniel, and the speculations about the time of the end that have troubled the United States in particular oh, for well over the past 150 years. We have numerous sects springing from this preoccupation. Seventh-day Adventists, for example, are the result of a failed prediction of the apocalypse. It was supposed to happen in 1840, I think. Um, when it didn't, they well, the remnant of the faithful formed that community. The Jehovah's Witness is another. Uh, some of you, like me, are old enough to remember the fear, the great excitement, in some quarters anyway, over the book, The Late Great Planet Earth, by a popular preacher. I find the subject depressing. Uh, because, A, of course, those who predict the end are always wrong. Um, it is the one thing we can say for certain about them, that they will get it wrong. And one reason, of course, is they're going directly against the words of the Lord Jesus, who said in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, where he does talk about the last things. It is not given to you to know, he says. And no one knows. Rather, he continues, be watchful. It's a passage which is a favorite with the monks, who will show up later on in my remarks. In fact, nowhere in monastic literature can you find the preoccupation with times and connecting the dots that is usually associated with the writing of an apocalypse. They are utterly, I appear utterly uninterested in that. Or rather see it as a distraction. And quote our Lord and understand by be watchful. An inner watch. Hence my title. Making the inside like the outside is a quotation from an ancient Christian ascetical work called the Gospel of Thomas. Some of you may have heard about it. Um, there's been a lot of nonsense written about it. Some people say it was Gnostic. It wasn't anything of the sort. It was, however, ascetical and mystical. And in one place, a saying which is ascribed to our Lord, which goes... Jesus said to them, 
When you make the two one, and when you make the inside like the outside, and the outside like the inside, and the above like the below, when you make the, ma the male and the female one and the same, so that the male not be male, nor the female female, and when you fashion eyes in place of an eye, and a hand in place of a hand, and a foot in place of a foot, and a likeness in place of a likeness, then you will enter the kingdom. Now, I could parse that uh, remarkable passage at length. Let's let it suffice simply to say uh, that what our Lord is calling for, or what at least the writer of the Gospel of Thomas is calling for, is a transformation. And this is very much part of the kind of writing called apocalypse. And here, if you will forgive me, I will take five or ten minutes as professor. It's a habit. Get out of it. First of all, there's the word itself, apocalypse. What does it mean? I remember asking my 18-year-olds 18 18 year when I was teaching Bible at university, what's apocalypse? Oh, it's the end. Oh, it's the world blowing up. Oh, it's this, it's that. It's catastrophe. Well, that's not what the word means at all. The word literally means unveiling. To take away the veil. And what happens when you take away the veil? You see something that was hidden. And in the context of this literature, which begins to appear, oh, around 200 years before Christ, and continues to be written up to a couple hundred years after the birth of Christ, The unveiling concerned is, well, it's several things. It's the divine will with regard to humanity and creation. It is the revelation in some of these books of God, God's self. It is lastly a matter of salvation and judgment. There are two apocalypses in the canon of the Bible. One each in the Old Testament and new. In the Old Testament, it is the book of Daniel. In the New Testament, it is the revelation of St. John, the apocalypse of St. John. That, that ends the collection of New Testament book. The last words in the scripture, and your Bibles are, even so, even so, amen, come Lord Jesus. Now a feature of some of this literature in the canonical scriptures, the dream of Daniel in chapter 7 and in the book of Revelation, the ascent of the writer, John, to the very throne of God in heaven involves, in, in some of this literature, we have that ascent to heaven and the vision of the heavenly throne. And in Daniel's case, and in John's, the directives ordering the end of the world and its renewal. But it's the vision 
I think that we should probably focus on. A second thing about the heavenly scene in the apocalypse of John, certainly, one could argue, I think it's implicit in Daniel, but in John it's quite explicit. The throne of God is also a heavenly temple. It's the heavenly holy of holies. You know, the building from the, from the, from the uh, Hebrew tabernacle and then the temple of Solomon. The temple was divided into three parts, or like our church. There's a porch right there. Here's the holy place, what we call the nave. And then behind the doors, behind the veil, behind the curtain, the holy of holies which was understood as the place of God himself. <clears throat> Enthroned upon the cherubim of the cover of the ark. If you uh, remember uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, kind of child's illustrated Bible ark. Um, the cherubim with the wings meeting and the lid. That that was called the mercy seat, or the seat of propitiation, um, <clears throat> because that's where the high priest on Yom Kippur, on his one entry into the Holy of Holies in the whole year, sprinkled the blood of the sacrifice for, the sin, for his sins and the sins of Israel, because that was understood as the place of the divine presence. And it's interesting, it's a phrase that St. Paul picks up and uses about the Lord Jesus in the epistle to the Romans. <coughs> and that brings me to a point <coughs> about apocalypse and our church. I don't mean just the Orthodox Church, I mean the church building, our churches. When Father, uh, Father Elijah Miller, one of my uh, graduate students at Marquette, <coughs> was courting his wife-to-be, he wondered, how do I make her orthodox? Or how can I persuade her? Well, first I better bring her to church, introduce her to it, because she was of Protestant background, Rebecca. And she walked, he told me, she walked into an Orthodox church for the first time, looked around and said, oh, apocalypse. And she got it exactly right. Exactly right. Every divine liturgy, every service, but really every, especially every divine liturgy is apocalypse in the full sense, in the full sense, it is the revelation of God in Christ. It is also the eschaton, that is, the end, the revelation of the world to come. If you approach divine liturgy properly, you approach it as the presence among us already and the vision among us already of the world to come. And again, back to, back to the book of Revelation. I think you might look uh, yourselves at, especially chapters 4 and 5, <clears throat> what you have there is a liturgy going on down to an including antiphonal singing, back and forth. You used to have my, my 18 year olds do it. Okay, you read that verse, you read that verse, you read that verse, you read that verse, and all together. The choirs come together at different points. 
But it's clearly a liturgy that's being portrayed. And this is something basic indeed to the revelation of uh, the true worship that God makes to Moses on Sinai in Exodus 25 following, and which continues in our worship. So the liturgy, the worship, the church is apocalypse. You want to know about the end? Come to church. Come to church and see. Now, of course, for many that would not be very satisfying. Remark. They want the pyrotechnics, yes? A melting earth, you know, dissolving stars, uh, uh, moon and sun going out. And unless you've got that, it's not really an apocalypse. It's kind of a pale imitation, yes? What's all this stuff about liturgy, anyway? What's that got to do with God? Well, a very great deal. But then, about the pyrotechnics. As I said at the beginning of these remarks, everyone who's predicted them has been wrong. Absolutely, completely, 100% wrong. <clears throat> so a preoccupation with them would seem to be a false path. Second, the sequence, say, as, as uh, laid out in a book like Revelation or Daniel, the sequence is a matter of, I would say, relative indifference. Uh, what matters is the wrap-up. Salvation and judgment. And once more, this is something that is present in the divine liturgy. Every time you come to the chalice, you come to judgment. You stand before the throne. You receive the truth. And if you receive the truth truly, you will see yourself. And that is the judgment. We have a picture of this in the vision of the prophet Isaiah. In the sixth chapter of that book, the beginning of Isaiah's, um, uh, of Isaiah's ministry as prophet starts or is a vision of God in the temple. He sees God and his throne in the temple and the, and the seraphim singing to him. He sees a liturgy, in fact. Right? Holy, 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 yes? And what's his reaction? What's he say? Anybody remember? He says, woe is me, for my eyes have seen the king. And I am a man of unclean mouth. Did God say anything? No. Nope. God doesn't say anything. God's just there. God just is. He judges himself. Isaiah does. Because he's in the presence of God, he sees what he is. In that sense, ultimately, God doesn't judge. The judgment is simply the revelation of what we are. 
in the light of the Divine Presence. And it's well said by mm, more than one saint. You'll find it in St. John of the Ladder, you'll find it in St. Maximus Confessor, you'll find it in St. Isaac of Nineveh, men who lived at the same time, 7th century, who didn't know anything about each other, and who are all three of them profoundly holy monks. And all three of them say something like this. I think the phrasing is actually St. John of the Ladder. The fire, the light of heaven and the fire of hell are one and the same thing. They are the presence of God. To those ready to receive him, light. To those who won't have him, but have to have him anyway because the apostle says he will be all in all. So whether you want him or not, he's going to be it. And the question then is, are you ready for him? Hence the thrust of my, of my quotation, the primary thrust. The outside that the quotation refers to is the world to come. And the work of the Christian life is to make the inside, that is, within, the inner life, your life, commensurate with that new world, with the world to come. Or put another way, perhaps, to make yourself a vessel Prepare yourself as a vessel for the Divine Presence. And there have been holy people down the centuries who have glimpsed within themselves this new reality. the presence and light and splendor of the world to come. Let me read you a couple. The first selection, the first reading comes from uh, a writer who lived in uh, Persian Mesopotamia Actually, he was Muslim at this point. Um, probably Iraq, somewhere. In the early 700s. His name was John of Daliatha, or John the Elder. And if you want to I'll read a bit more of him. He's, he's, he's been published in his letters. His wonderful letters have been published in English uh, a couple of years ago. But here he is writing to another monk. Man of God, how long are you going to console yourself with little obscurities? Meaning uh, his own, John's letters. Become instead entirely flame and burn up everything around you in order to see the beauty hidden within you. And then, make this your, and then make this prayer. You who are hidden and concealed within me, reveal in me your hidden mystery. Manifest to me your beauty that is within me. You who, you who built me as a temple for you to dwell in, cause the cloud of your glory to dwell in me that the ministers, the, the angels, of your sanctuary may cry out, cry out in love for you, holy, 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 as an utterance which burns as fire and spirit, 
in a stirring which is commingled with wonder and astonishment. Four centuries earlier, a Greek Christian writer wrote, If by the grace of God the intellect both turns away from the passions and puts off the old man, man then it will see its own constitution at the time of prayer like a sapphire or the color of heaven which recalls as well what the scripture names the place of God seen by the elders on Mount Sinai. It calls this place and the vision the peace by which one sees in oneself that peace which surpasses every intellect and which guards our heart. For another heaven is imprinted on a pure heart. <coughs> so heaven is already within. All of us who are baptized, and this is a theme, by the way, that's repeated in the literature of the church, the monastic literature of the church, because uh, the monks had to remind their brother monks, some of the monks had to remind some other monks, you need this church. You don't get everything just by going off and praying. You need the church and its sacraments. And one of the ways they emphasize this is, is by repeating the thought. You'll find in St. Maximus Confessor, for example, in his Centuries on Love, that everything is already given at baptism. And by everything, I mean everything. <coughs> Not just, um, you know... <coughs> Salvation as a, as a kind of escape from condemnation. But heaven, the world to come, the last things, it's all there, given in the sacrament. So our, work, our life as Christians, to use another image, is to become what, what we already are by virtue of baptism by virtue of our incorporation into Christ. And a last quotation from <coughs> someone 300 years after uh, John of Daliatha. This is Saint Simeon, the new theologian. who lived in the 11th century A.D. Well, that's and he has um, a little treatise called The Day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, of course, is a phrase which since the prophet Amos was the first to use it, signals the end. Yes. The coming of God. And St. Simeon writes, if I get, get him right, Sorry. Yes. The revelation of the Lord's divinity becomes, in fact, a judgment for those to whom it is revealed. No one could have endured the glory of his divinity as manifested naked of its joining and expressible union in the God-man. The divinity, which is to say the grace of the All-Holy Spirit, 
has never appeared to anyone who is without faith. And if it were to appear by some paradox among men, it would show itself as fearful and dreadful, as not illumining but burning, not as giving life, but as punishing dreadfully. And he uses the example of St. Paul being struck blind by the light on the road to Damascus. From this lesson, St. Saint Paul's conversion, we therefore learn that grace on the one hand is unapproachable and invisible to those who are still possessed by unbelief and by the passions, and on the other hand is seen and revealed to those who with faith and in fear and trembling do the commandments and give evidence of a worthy repentance. This same grace of itself incontestably brings the future judgment to pass in them. Rather, indeed, it becomes itself the day of divine judgment, by which he who is purified is continually illumined, sees himself as he is in truth, and in every detail. He is as well judged and examined by the divine fire, and thus enriched by the water of his tears, his whole body is moistened, and he is baptized entire, little by little, by the divine fire and spirit, and becomes wholly immaculate, a son of the light and of the day. And the takeaway, the day of the Lord will never come upon them because they are already in it forever and continuously. The day of the Lord is not going to be revealed suddenly to those who are ever illumined by the divine light, but comes rather unexpectedly for those in the darkness of the passions. For them it will be fearful, and they will experience it as unbearable fire. So, that's the judgment. which already is occurring, right? And I lay before you, beloved, together with myself, our effort should not be with the, with the, the whens and the wheres, but with the inner person with uh, cultivation, as St. Macarius the Great says, the cultivation of the earth of the heart. That it may bear fruit. That it may become, may become a fount, to mix metaphors. And I maybe become a font of the water of life springing up into life eternal. That life, as I said before, which we already have. That's all. You can have the clock back. Were there any questions? Half an hour. Not bad. You've asked me so many questions over the past three weeks. If you didn't get a proper answer from me, you could get a proper answer from, from the boss. <laughs> you asked them to save them up for me, didn't you? Yeah, I, I did. I mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't be shy, it's okay. <laughs> Adam? Um, I'm not, are you familiar with David Bentley Hart, who just released a book, All oh, Shall Be Saved? And then it, it seemed like to that question, what about the question of eternal to the kingdom and judgment? And then the timelessness with the preceding classes we have, that's still... Well, I'm sure uh, Mr. Hart pointed out um, the precedence in the patristic literature 
Uh, he probably cited, I don't know if he cited Theodore Mopsuestia, though he could have, but certainly Gregory of Nyssa, Isaac of Syria, and before them both, Origen of Alexandria. The notion that all will be saved, that, that is a kind of minority position that has been and continues to be around. For, say, St. Isaac um, and St. Gregory, it's the notion that against the infinite love of God, it, is, it will be impossible for the creator, for the created being, to forever say no. And that's very attractive. On the other hand, there's St. Maximus Confessor, who says, no, it's a matter of the, if you will, the infinite capacity of the divine image in us, which is to be respected, and which can say no forever. Now, Metropolitan Callistus Ware, I think, put it best. He put, to, he, put, um, he put the way I see it <clears throat> nicely. He wrote somewhere, we might hope for this, but we can't teach it as doctrine. So you may hope it, but uh, even for those who think it's temporary, hell's pretty nasty. And, and you will, for St. Isaac, I think it's, it's sort of God's last effort to get your attention. <laughs> <That's>, <coughs> I have an online question. It says, with the perspective of Christ being present and people receiving him to their glorification or condemnation, what does this mean for praying for the reposed? We hear that many are and can be saved after death, but how is this? Don't know. <laughs> I don't know how it works. I know that we do. And there are very ancient, uh, the oldest uh, Christian document in Latin is called the, the Passion of Perpetua, the, the Martyrdom of Perpetua. She was a North African <coughs> matron who was killed in the arena because she was Christian. But she's, she spends some months in prison. And during these months, she's much obsessed, much worried about her brother who took his own life. And she has a vision of him, a dream of him, in a terrible, dark, and hopeless place. So she, she's given the advice to pray for him. And she does, day and night. And is rewarded at the end with another dream. This time of, this time of him, not exactly happy, <laughs> but removed from the terrible place and in a, at least a tolerable <coughs> and is comforted. Now that, whether one cares to take that as actual or not, it's certainly indicative of very ancient Christian faith that the prayers of the faithful do have some, that there's a connection between us and those who have died. In a way that death does not snap. We're still linked. And our prayers of them have an effect. That's the best I could do. <clears throat> Any other questions for His Eminence this evening? 
making it very easy. Yes, okay. Is there a concept of an intermediary phase after we die before? Oh, like purgatory? Uh, I know that we don't believe in purgatory, but... Well, what we don't believe in is the kind of way that purgatory is worked out. Uh, now, purgatory was a kind of answer to a popular demand uh, in the medieval Latin West. People wanted to know what the effect of penances were, what, what they had to do to get to heaven. <coughs> and so it's, um, it's treated as a sort of, um, how do you put it? You're working out uh, what you did wrong, uh, where you messed up, in order to get kind of washed clean uh, for heaven. But in very great detail, and in a number of Catholic missiles of my youth, there would be lines like, if you say so many Hail Marys at this point in the Mass, you get, what, a hundred years off in purgatory or something like that? And I was just, and I wondered, for the first time I thought, how do they know? <laughs> um, I can't. Well, they can't, obviously. They couldn't, no. On the other hand, in the Orthodox tradition, there is certainly a notion of a trajectory. I mean, say you're, you're, you're going along life like this, let's say a little bit of progress, yeah? What, you die and then all of a sudden, boop! No, I think we continue as it were on the plane that we were, and that seems to be the idea of the, of the church fathers, <clears throat> on the plane in which we leave this life. So there is some kind of process. I think that, that they do understand, and that's maybe, the, again, the place for the prayers. And there's some kind of process. We don't know about it in any detail, but that, <coughs> that I think is the consensus. Yes? Today I learned that the Gospel of Thomas was not Gnostic. No, it is not. And I'd like to know a little bit more about that. How do we view that writing? Well, it disappeared, you know, uh, from general Christian awareness. I think in Greek, pretty early. In Syriac, I think probably into the fifth century, it's still being read. Yes, it's, there's not a Gnostic, there's no, there's no element whatever of Gnosticism in it. Um, Gnosticism, I, and I would characterize Gnosticism by this one clear family trait, the two creators, yes? There's the good God and Father of the Lord Jesus, then there's the nasty creator of the filthy world that we live in. There is none of that dualism in Thomas, zero. It is an ascetical and mystical document. And one, one could talk about it at greater length. Um, and it survives not so much in memory, but in the influence that it has, the themes uh, that it touches on, which is all, which by the way, it was taking up from prior tradition or traditions um, in the ascetical writers especially of the Syriac-speaking East. It's the oldest, it's the place, it's the, it's the first time, by the way, the, oh, we have a, a shred of uh, Thomas from the late second century, um, you know, just before 200 AD. And on that shred we have one verse, and it's the oldest use appearance of the word monk in a Christian document. Monachos. The monks, or the monachoi, 
the single will enter the bridal chamber. Okay. Maybe one last question? No. Oh, okay. uh, yes, <laughs> this has a good more nice. So, if, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Your Eminence, for being with us, and we will now uh, uh, go downstairs, and please do join us. We have some uh, refreshments, we have some food, uh, and then we will officially go and throw the mortgage documents onto the, uh, onto the bonfire, which we have outside. Uh, so please do join us for some refreshments and to celebrate.